Okay, good morning everyone. All right, so we're almost coming to the end of our study. Uh, so I think we met last three weeks back, right? It's been a long gap. So let's just do a quick review of uh, where we started. I think we started with the chapter on praying for the un. Right? Uh, we talked about how Satan hinders the work of ministering the gospel. Right? So every time we want to share the gospel, every time we want to be a testimony, the enemy hinders that because the enemy knows that the power of the gospel is able to change people's lives, right? We saw how the enemy binds people by blinding the minds of people, right? So many times we are talking to, you know, uh, or sharing the gospel, but they don't accept it. Why? Because their mind is blinded, right? So they, in their mind, it, it's like, no, I cannot believe this. Who puts that blindness? It's the enemy, right? Second, we saw that uh, the enemy holds people in bondage. Now, what is a bondage, right? When when a sin is is continually happening in our life, it becomes a bondage, right? So I was in uh, Rajasthan and uh, in Charkani, and you know, the moment we went there, oh, the first day after the first session, there was a line of people. And most of them were, you know, demon possessed. They were in bondage uh, over years of people from other faiths. Uh, but what happens is they, you know, they partake in the other, you know, the other festivals and things. They partake in food and the worship. And I saw, you know, the moment I saw them and they were all there, uh, you could just feel that bondage, you know. Many of these demons began to speak. They started saying, you know, this is what they do. This is why I'm here. This is why I'm not going to leave. Right? You see the bondage, right? It, it, it stops us, stops the people from believing the truth of the gospel. Right? And, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, when we went there many times, I've noticed this many times, so because of the anointing inside of us, Demons don't come near us at times. It's many times, oh, you know, they will, they will stand there, say, no, we can't come there. We will not come there. Why? Because of the anointing inside us. So the enemy has these ways. One, he blinds the minds of people. He holds people in bondage. And those bondages can is, is not only for unbelievers. It can happen to us as believers as well. Right? Sometimes we we may say the wrong things or jealousy, pride, anger. If we continue to live in them, what will happen? What will happen? If, if you continue to live in sin, what happens? The bondage, right? If I continually get upset or angry with people, what's happening? It becomes a bondage. And the Bible says that it's not of the it's not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Right? It is it is sin to be angry. It becomes a bondage. Right? And so it's very important as believers, we understand that yesterday we spoke about it, right? The work of the cross has broken the bondage. Now that bondage can be a small bondage, it can be a bondage of you know over generations. Now one of those demons came up to me and said, I will destroy your family and your two children. Will destroy them. You will not live. Even now, you will, when you go back, you will not live. Uh, but you know the work of the devil, right? He brings intimidation. He brings fear. So all I said was, I rebuke that. I don't take what you're saying. You're a, you're cursed. You're broken. The work of the cross has, you know, this. And and I didn't do anything. Many a place. Many a times. They all came standing. Some of them came at midnight. They came uh, bringing people who were possessed. And we just prayed for them. Just a simple prayer. And the bondages were broken. You know, they came and said, oh, I feel so, I feel peace. I feel a light. I feel, you know, this weight has been lifted off. How is that? Because of the work of the cross. 
because we we understand okay this is what the holy spirit can do so it doesn't matter what kind of bondage people are in right? uh, no matter what the devil is binding them in you and i have the authority to break it right so i told this you know, the demon was standing I, I was telling the demon you can't do anything because there's a blood protection around my family there's a blood protection around me and he said yes there's somebody else also standing next to you please tell them to go you know why because they cannot stand the enemy cannot stand the work of the holy spirit right but you and i must understand that now if we don't understand it we're going to look at okay see this is what the enemy is doing our focus will be on the enemy or oh, this guy has been in drugs for 20 years or this guy this guy has been in bondage for 20 years how is it going to you know remember who's inside you right so thirdly the enemy hinders the proclamation of the gospel and every time we want to share the gospel with people the enemy will stop us say so don't do it it's not worth it there's no time uh, it's not so powerful who's going to believe you you're not even anointed so all these lies the enemy brings into our mind but when we looked at um, the church's responsibility for us is to bring people um, from darkness to the light uh, the church has kingdom authority and god has given us spiritual weapons and i think last class we talked about how uh, god is sending us into the battlefield but he's not saying okay you go fight he's giving us weapons we talked about it right imagine you know, a person in the army he's wearing the entire guard he's got his guns he's got his uh, equipment everything is there with him but he's sitting in the tent and saying no i will not go i'm scared that person would not be worthy to go into the battlefield right so all they'll question hey what is this you're, you're all set you're ready to go why aren't you going so remember that you and I, as we're ministering to people, we are the battlefield, but we must use the weapons. And Paul writes to the Corinthians, what does he say? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God. Right? So when you look at your weapons that you have, they're mighty in God. Right? So don't look at your gifts and your talents. That is secondary. What does the word say? The weapons of our warfare are mighty in God, right? So many a times we you know, we used to travel. So one of the things I do is I I always spend time, you know, additional time in prayer when we're going to minister to people. Why? Because we know that uh, there's a spiritual fight happening. Right? How do these demons know that I have two children? How do they know where I stay? How do they know things in the spirit? They know. Right. But the weapons of our warfare are mightier. Right? So when we understand that, whether they are demon-possessed people or whether they're just unbelievers or friends of those who are not believers, all that doesn't matter. You know that you have the weapons, but you have to use it. Right? So then we'll talk about bringing spiritual transformation. I think we stopped here. So how do we bring spiritual transformation? Right? What is spiritual transformation? Now, if you look at a certain region, you see that there's so much of, you know, maybe idol worship or uh, work of the enemy that's happening there. How can we bring spiritual transformation? We engage in prayer and worship and exercise our spiritual authority over the lost. Yeah? We engage in prayer and worship. What does prayer do? What does worship do? It destroys the work of the devil. Right? When we're praying, there's a spiritual warfare, right? And the works of the enemy is being destroyed. His grips are being loosened, right? And even when we worship, the atmosphere, the glory of the Lord, the presence of God brings a change, right? So even you all, as you all are praying and worshiping in the morning, never make it a routine. I never say, oh, okay, okay, eight o'clock prayer, come on, or oh, drag yourself there. 
okay pray who's 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 singing the song so all this never have that attitude if you have that attitude stop go back and ask god god restore change things in me because the more it becomes monotonous you're doing things we'll be doing things just it won't there won't be any power in that right now i i know right because i've been part of bible college i know there's a routine you get up you do this you do this but one thing that i constantly said to myself was it may be a routine but even in that routine i want to see god working in my life i want to see the presence of god ministering to me right you go in with that desire right and remember we cannot control people's choices we cannot dictate their choices we cannot manipulate people each person has their choice of accepting the gospel now what is our responsibility right uh, we are ministering the gospel we are sharing the gospel now it's their choice to accept it or not to accept it now we can't control their choice right but we can pray for them say god remove that blindness i'm going to go speak to this person i'm going to go minister to this person i'm going to go pray for healing do a supernatural work or let give me the wisdom to answer his questions the right way and this person has too many questions how do i answer his questions now if we go prepared there's a difference right and when we go unprepared there's a difference right so through prayer and exercising of spiritual authority we can bring spiritual transformation in a in a people in a person's life and in a certain place i remember we used to do this in early 2012 we we went to uh, different places in north india we used to also go to few places in uh, south as well so we used to have full night of worship right and uh, we went to this one city i think it was mysore uh, i'm not sure which city but i think it's mysore we went there and we thought six we used to do 6 pm to 6 am worship and prayer right so whole night worship and prayer it, it used to be very strenuous but uh, we used to always think okay will people come so this one time we went to mysore and uh, uh, you know we we have like so 6 to 6 we i think we used to have like four worship leaders or three worship leaders uh, they used to lead like one and a half hours or each so and then in between have prayer points pray for those points so we should do it all the way till 6 am so we went to mysore once we were setting up the speakers and all of that nobody is there in the hall right we were, so we were doing 6 am 6 pm to 6 am nobody is come right we thought oh man what to do uh, it's almost 5:30 we've set up everything uh, maybe two three people have come and then i remember as i was I, i had to lead the first session that day so i remember uh, you know we we all as we went back and we were we were praying and we, and i remember thinking to myself man what if nobody comes how will i lead i mean you know you, you have this feeling nobody is there on the stage initially you know i used to think oh nobody is there what worship will do uh but then i i just sensed the holy spirit saying you do what you have come here to do i will bring the people i'm bringing a change in the city we started the first song i think it was two three songs down the line by the time we finished the three songs there was maybe about 400 people in that place and they had to call some people to put a tent outside and extra chairs and all of it we ended the first session we were about i think 500 people for a whole night prayer right now it's not it's easy for a day right people will stay for the day like 9 to 5 but imagine the whole night right and what happened was after that meeting there was a spiritual change in that entire city like pastors began to say hey we have to do something uh in our city we have to you know build our city up we have to you know to speak to our youth minister to the youth so there was this this complete transformation in thinking there was this unity among pastors there was all that you know disagreements everything went away how did it happen just through prayer and worship right and even now when in my so we are in touch with few of them all of them are doing a very good work 
all pastors coming together, there's this feeling of unity. And there's wonderful change. The, the churches in, uh, especially the south of Karnataka, north of Karnataka, are growing. The Kannada churches, the regional churches, they're all growing. People are accepting the Lord. Spiritual transformation, right? So expecting for that is very important, right? Uh, sometimes the enemy brings these, you know, thoughts saying that, hey, it's not going to work out. What difference are you going to make? You can make a difference, right? Whether it's two, three of you, whether it's all 10, 20 of you, you can make a difference, right? So even as you pray, pray for the Lord to do his work towards the lost. And then in spiritual warfare, establish the presence of God uh, and through corporate worship and through exercising our spiritual authority to destroy what Satan is doing uh, from hindering people to come to Christ. So prayer and worship, very important. Then again, the same things you can pray, praying for the lost, pray for God to ask and ask God for the city, for the region, ask God for people to be touched and transformed. Pray for the Holy Spirit to bring conviction into people's heart. What is conviction? Right? When, when people are uh, you know, in sin, the Holy Spirit comes and convicts them of sin. Hey, this is wrong. You need to repent of these sins. Now, if you look through the scriptures, remember in the book of Acts, right? the first mess sermon that uh, Peter spoke of uh, at the Pentecost, what happened? The Bible says they were gripped in their heart. They were convicted. Right? When Peter shared the message after the Pentecost, he said, hey, this is what has happened. This is what you all did. You all have crucified the Son of God, but he has raised himself from the dead. And this is his presence, his power has come here, his Holy Spirit. So he's explaining the whole thing. What happened? There was a grip. And thousands of people, we're not talking about hundreds or two, three people. Thousands of people accepted that message of the cross. Right? So when we talk about the Holy Spirit, He is like wind. Right? He can pour out, you know, just move on people, whether it's two people, whether it's 2,000 people. He can just move about. Right? So when you're praying for a city or you're praying for this region, you can expect the Holy Spirit, God. Holy Spirit, convict these people. Can we, now, we may not see the fruit of it, but you're doing a work. You're probably sowing seeds in prayer. Right? Now, remember, God's kingdom is it's, 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 a, it's a kingdom where all of us work together. Right? One person you know, sows the seed, one person waters it, another person sees the reward. But God makes it grow, another person sees the reward. Right. So just because we are praying for, you know, for example, this area, we may not see families coming into Christ, but you have sown the seed. You have asked the Holy Spirit. You're praying that the Holy Spirit will touch lives, convict people of sins. Now, nobody will know this. Nobody will put a garland around you and clap for you and call you on stage. That's OK. Right. Remember, your reward is in heaven. You've done what you've been asked to do. Pray that God will move upon people, bringing them to repentance and to the knowledge of the truth of God. Ask God to grant them the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that their spiritual eyes are enlightened. So these are just like prayer points, right? Ask God, God, open their spiritual eyes. Or ask God to, uh, you know, God, let them know your word. Right? Let them get to hear your word and let them let it touch their lives. Um, and, uh, and also you can pray, Lord, let them know the purposes, their calling in their life. Uh, these are simple things that we can pray for. Then we can pray, God, send forth your laborers who will share the gospel of Jesus. Now, we may not be in a position to go, right? But God can raise up laborers to go and minister to people, to share the gospel, right? Pray for God's power to be demonstrated with many signs and wonders. Ask God for supernatural encounters as we see in the book of Acts that will point them to Jesus. Asking God 
for supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles. You know, the church in um, Iraq and the church in Iran, both these churches, the churches there, when I say church, it's different churches. People are having visitations of God, of the Lord Jesus. Jesus, there are, there are encounters where Jesus himself has come and revealed himself to them, saying, this is what you read, this is what you do. And through the whole pandemic, through, you know, through uh, television, many of them have accepted Christ. And many uh, people in the Islamic faith have, have converted. Right? Uh, how? Through signs, wonders, and miracles. Now, the sad thing to say is sometimes, you know, uh, in our nation especially, uh, when you go up north, you see people, they receive their healing, they believe in Jesus, but after they receive the healing, they, sometimes they go back to what they were doing before. You know, now what happens is you're opening the door back to the enemy. Whenever we go to North India and we minister, why are these people coming to church? They believe it. They, they, they've heard the gospel. They like the gospel. Right? They like, oh, Jesus, Parmeshwar, Acha hai, all that. But then what happens? A feast will come. Right? So even when we went to Rajasthan, I asked them, see, they're, they're all believers. Right? But what's happening? Why, is, why, why are you like this? So they say, no, she goes, you know. Uh, any feast they go they eat the food that was offered to idols or they you know they're so used to the practices that they say okay let's just do it it's okay once a year no let's partake of it now what's happening they're opening the doors to the devil and the devil comes begins to work in their life right so here's the thing when we encounter the love of christ when we encounter who he is we are not to go back to other things why? Because we'll be opening doors to the enemy. And the enemy is ready to come and sit inside. If he, he finds one open door, he's willing to come. Right? So we must be very careful. Right? And, and even as we are praying, you say, God, give us supernatural signs and wonders. Right? How many of you over here have experienced a miracle, like maybe just healing or a um or here in, in this place in BC, in Bible college? I'm asking about in Bible college, you? OK. It's good. So we need to be open to that, right? Uh, open to supernatural things of God. And if we, if, we don't, if we're not open to it, then how can we accept and pray for it, others for it? Right? So something is I believe in. If I come up with my, with my, you know what? You should learn the drums. If I believe in playing the drums and it's good, then only I can tell him. Right? Now, if I'm not going to but uh, so you're only not playing drums, why are you telling me to learn? Right? I can only give something that I know of. If I experience the supernatural and the manifestations of God, the supernatural work of God, only then I can encourage people, hey, why don't you do this? Now, if I'm reading the Word of God, if I don't read the Word of God, I don't spend time meditating on the Word of God, how can I tell you to do it? Right? right? That's what Jesus says. No, you Pharisees, you first do, then teach. Yes or no? Right? So if, if you and I are to make an impact into people's lives, we have to first do, then teach. Right? But remember, we are, even when as we do, we are doing it empowered by the Holy Spirit. And when we are teaching, we are doing it empowered by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who is touching lives. It's not about us, right? He's using us. We are the tools that God is using, right? So exercising spiritual authority to open prison doors, establish God's presence through praise and worship once again, declare Christ's finished work of the cross, for salvation of souls in the city. On the basis of the cross, because of the power of the blood of Jesus, and in the authority of Jesus' name, declare over power of darkness, over your city, over people, 
people who are in bondage, declare it. Now, how many of you or how many of us understand the cross? Is a question. Understand the power of the cross. Or is it just, okay, cross, Jesus? Do we understand the cross? Yes or no? What is the cross? Tell me, you understand. Tell me, what is the cross? Plus sign. It's the power of God to salvation. Yeah, that that's theology. Right. I, I, tell me, what is the cross to you? When you think of the cross, what is it that comes to your mind? Sorry? Romans. Promise. Very good. Okay. Huh? Forgiveness, pure love. Very good. Redemption. Redemption. Okay. All I will call it students. What else? It's your place, but Jesus is there. Okay. Okay. So that's all good, right? All theological, wonderful answers. But something, a picture in my mind, right? When I look at the cross, the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, like Jesus just crushing a snake. It's a picture. Right? It's a picture in my mind. Two pictures I have. One is that. The second picture is in Colossians. Paul says, he made a public spectacle of his victory. So Jesus didn't die on the cross and then go hide somewhere. He didn't do that, right? Ephesians 4 says he went down to the you know, lower parts. He preached the gospel. He went, he took the keys of death and hell. And when you picture all that, any demon comes and stands in front of you is nothing. Many people, you know, we, from you know, have asked me, "Hey, you're not scared of that? I mean, you you were not scared at all? Why? Because the first thing that comes to my mind is the cross. What is the cross? Hey, Jesus has crushed the devil. So the person, the the demon that's working inside him is already defeated. Right? Where's the where's the victory for him? There's no victory, and I am his child." And Jesus has made a public spectacle so all the demons here know that they are defeated. But they're just bringing fear, bringing doubt, bringing these thoughts. Right? So the way you look at the cross is very important. It's a place of power. It's a place of victory. All what you said is right. A place of love and forgiveness, redemption. But these should not just be words. No? Or, redemption, love, it should be something in our spirit that when you walk your Christian life, right, you'll really experience it. You know, as Bible college students, it's very easy to, you know, take in everything. But after your two or three years, you move on and you get into ministry, you'll see the real, the real ministry starts. All of a sudden you'll say, hey, man. I learned this, but then so different here. I learned about demonology, all these things. It's so different. I learned about end times, but it's so different. It's true, right? I, I told you, right? I got 100 on 100 in faith. I went there in front of the demon, I put zero. <laughs> I, I was not able to. I was scared. I was literally scared. But I, I, I didn't, I, I told those other. Like my friends were all from the villages, so they were used to it. They were saying, hey, Paul, what? It's nothing, demon. But for me, hey, demon, you <laughs> I'm not used to it. I'm from Bangalore. Very less demon manifestations here. But they were used to it. Hey, they won't do anything, Paul. What is this? You're 100 on 100, faith. You're the best student in the class. You're getting scared of demons. I said, yes, it's true. And I realized, hey, everything I know is here. Of course, I know Jesus. I, uh, you know, I knew that I'm a new creation, but everything was here stored up. That I was not able to release it in the in the spiritual. It is all over here stored up. You tell me the verses. I will quote you the verses. All of Psalms one, Psalms nineteen, Psalms one twenty one, Psalms hundred. I'll quote it. But in front of the demon, I'm running. 
doesn't make sense. So what I'm trying to say is what we read, what we understand must be something of the spirit. That's when, when we release it, there will be an anointing. And the devils cannot stand. So it's not always I was very bold and very strong, you know, from the deep. I was very scared. But over time, I prayed and I asked God, God, let make it a reality in me. It's not a show, right? Make it a reality. Because demons recognize. The work of the devil recognizes, and the Holy Spirit recognizes us. Right? So let's go into the next chapter, nurturing a new believer. So every time we are you know, especially in pastoral ministry, uh, we may see this, you know, uh, new believers come into the church or even, uh, you know, even in um, small groups, new believers come in. What must we do? Right? Now, Paul is writing to the Corinthians. He says to them, you all are still drinking milk. You all should be eating the food of the word of God. You are still drinking milk. And. And so what must we do in nurturing a new believer? Here are a few stages, right? First one, teach God's truth. Everyone say that, teach God's truth. When a believer, new believer comes into, the, into ministry, don't go and open uh, revelations. Uh, Jesus will come back again. We will stand with him. He'll get scared. He'll say, I don't want to stand in front of anybody. No. Teach the truth of God's word, the simple things. One, foundations, Holy Spirit, water baptism, the Lord's table, praise and worship, faith. Just the basics. Right? You start off with that. You, you give them material, share material. And then you can go to the higher levels. Right? Why aren't we doing, uh, you know, the third year subjects now for you guys. There's a, there's a there's a reason, right? So next semester you'll get end times, you'll have hermeneutics or homiletics and uh, different subjects, right? Developing the soul. So these are it's all through stages, right? And then Right. And then you go into training in spiritual disciplines. So personal time in prayer, personal reading of God's word, godly living, repentance, holiness. Now, the thing is, we must be doing this. Right? Prayer, personal reading of God's word, godly living. So you teach them that. Then you connect them with Christian fellowship, which is very important. Right? So, for example, if you're a pastor and you've got a new believer coming into the church, you first teach them God's truth, tell them, hey, prayer is important, worship is important, godly living is important. And then you connect them either to a small group, if they're already part of your church, or connect them to mature people in the church and get them to have fellowship. Fellowship is very important. You know, because sometimes you may think, hey, I will get up, I will do ministry, and I will stay alone, I will do it alone. It can't be done, right? God always works in a team. The Lord Jesus himself, being God, what did he do? Chose 12 people. Then he chose 72 people. He said, go and preach. So God does not work arbitrarily. He doesn't work alone. He always works as a team. The Lord Jesus set that example for us, right? So build teams, connect them to life groups, Christian fellowships. And then after that, equip them or disciple them to serve others, right? So you're taking them first from being just new believers. You're teaching them basic foundations, worship, prayer, faith, all of that. Then you're teaching them, hey, you have to pray, spend more time in God, reading the word, living holy life. You connect them to fellowship, and then you're training them to start ministering to others. And you know what happened? Uh, this happened when I was, I think it was 2010, I guess. 10. I was in Bible college. And uh, I think it was first year. Um, yeah, I think it was first year. And uh, you know, some people complained about me. It's a recording, no? Some people complained about me. 
said the ball is making us get up at 5 am he should get everyone in the bus class he's the class captain i said uh, i didn't complain i said yeah of course what do you want me to pat your back and say good job no right if you've not done it you've not done it and so they said uh, no we want to change the captain now. see i don't it doesn't matter who is the captain i'll still tell you okay whoever is the captain it doesn't matter to me i will still tell you as long as you're here you will have to do what is right so they said they went and they complained it was in class you know they said so i was sitting outside and then we came back into class and said okay i knew they would because they told me they got to come there and then after that oh so they, they all the students thought oh now he's going to get nice <laughs> But what happened was, was uh, in front of everyone. He said, uh, oh, "Okay, that's okay." So he said, "Let's go to Ajmer." So uh, he came up to me and he said, "Paul, we'll go to Ajmer." I thought he's going to shout. He said, "Paul, you come. I want to meet you." He said, "Paul, let's go to Ajmer." And I said, "Okay, Pastor. What will I do? I don't know." So he said, we went. I was what, twenty-three years old. I think I went there. and he was and he was teaching all oh, the whole day teaching i was sitting there getting bored uh, full day right kingdom builders you bored in the sense i, I you know i i'm just sitting there the whole day you know first bench sitting in. but I, all my classmates say hey, how come you went uh? <laughs> then again we went to another place so you know at that young age i used to go and but one conference I was, I think, I was in second year at that time. One class pastor said, "Paul, you teach." Now there are four hundred, five hundred pastors sitting there. All are in, you know, twenty years, thirty years in ministry. He said, "You teach one session. You've come at least three, four times to this conference. Were you listening <laughs> in the conference? I don't know, but you teach." I got very nervous. So, okay, right, one hour session. I said, "Okay, I prepare for two hours." thinking okay in case emergency i'll have some extra you know i was very nervous right? and this was in this was in nasik and i and it was after lunch and that when i full confident i began to preach 15 minutes everything i told out so within 20 minutes the session is over <laughs> looking at past was i saying carry on for it's done pastor and i came back and i was so disappointed in myself i said man how can i do this i prepared for two hours everything i've said in a hurry i finished it in 20 minutes i said i should never be a preacher i should never be a <laughs> teacher i don't know why and i thought i'll never get an opportunity again but over time i learned and i thank god for those opportunities now what am i trying to get at there will be times when as 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 believers we have to give opportunities to others we have to train up other people disciple other people give them opportunities right uh, and when we do that they really get to know and understand hey this is something that god has called me to this is something that i can do this is something that i can't do and so they be able to recognize right so new believers sometimes they don't understand what i should, what they should do so you and i must be willing to give opportunities right give them opportunities in weekend schools workshops mission teams all these places be then being a disciple maker how jesus discipled he selected 12 he told them to be with him they heard him they saw him in close proximity right so when you are ministering to people let people see their lives see your lives right um he personally taught them beyond what he taught the crowd he corrected them and he rebuked them right uh he helped them in their character right and he challenged them and he sent them out on assignments so wonderful right i like that he corrected and rebuked and he dealt with their character issues right so correcting and rebuking again there's a way of doing it right yesterday we talked about it a little bit right there's a way to correct correct and love there's a way to rebuke uh you know rebuke is a strong word but there's a way that you can you know bring correction into people's lives and as you grow in leadership you will learn it right i've made hundreds of mistakes right 
uh, hundreds of mistakes. But the best part is we learn from those mistakes. Right? Hey, I should not have spoken like that. I should have said it this way. Uh, the same thing, I should have said it in a different tone or a different, uh, you know, uh, with a different face expression. You know, people notice as ministers of God. You know, sometimes you get email, so your shirt button was open during preaching. They notice. Right? People notice everything. So it's, it's very important that we, uh, in, in terms of discipling, you you understand that, hey, I'm making, I'm, I'm training up somebody else for the sake of the gospel. Right? So importance of local church for discipleship. Uh, some of the things we do is teaching from the pulpit, of course, modeling uh, in real life, life groups, uh, uh, basically small groups. Then we have one-on-one -on -one discipling. If people are interested, they can just you know be disciple foundation classes, weekend schools, uh, local church ministry. I think APC we have a lot of local church. I mean, a lot of ministries within the church, and uh, I think all of you are going to Central. You know, every week you're at Central, so serving in the sound and setup team and the other team. So learn as much as you can, right? Uh, you know what was my thing in uh, Central? Uh, that time Central was. Maybe over 300 odd people. So my job was to clean the chairs. Uh, every chair, it is. I had to do it, huh? Because nowadays, I think the chairs is somebody doing it in Central? No. Uh, we were in another place, and uh, during the week, nobody used that place. So a lot of dust would settle in. So to clean that chair. So every week, that was my thing. Then I got promotion. From cleaning chairs, I went to ushering team. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> Please, I used to get so bored sometimes. Like, what is this? Yeah, you have to keep smiling. No, you can't stop smiling. Whoever comes, you have to smile. But I learned so much, you know. I learned so much from all of this because there's all of these things build us up. You know, sometimes they look as if they are not important, but they are important. And now, as as I'm pastoring a church location, I understand. Hey, a sharing should be there. Greeters should be at the door. So first thing, when I go to church, I make sure, OK, the volunteers are there for greeting. If they're not there, I will stand there, because I've done it before. A worship evening, we had a few volunteers were there. Some of them were not there. Because we did sound and set up at Central, I was able to do it here. It was a training. Because I've cleaned the chairs at Central, we did it at East the other day. So it's all training. It's all part. Sometimes we think, okay, pastor means stand and preach. That's there. But then all of these things are training. And even as we are ministering to new believers, to people around us, you encourage them. Hey, take part. It's okay. Me, the maybe the most menial task. But when we do it uh, with the mindset that hey, I'm, this is going to be beneficial for God's kingdom. God will definitely use you all, right? So engaging in evangelism, engaging in missions. And then there's youth retreats and so many other uh, youth camps, church camps. These are ways of uh, discipleship. And then uh, overcoming practical challenges. Again, there will be threats. There will be persecutions. There will be abandonment. People will threaten. People will persecute you for your faith. That's OK. We, we learned about overcoming inhibitions, right? Uh, then obstacles. People may find obstacles from going to church, uh, cultural and religious practices that are challenges, right? Sometimes people may think, hey, I don't like the way this church does this, or I don't like this practice in the church or that practice in the church. So we overcome all these uh, small things, right? Uh, marriage, Christian community, uh, sometimes uh, you know, uh, in in terms of marriage, uh, there are different beliefs, different uh, thoughts that people have, right? So we we look at what the Bible talks about marriage, and we help people overcome practical challenges, right? Uh, you know, there is there, there's there'll be times when people say, "Hey, now uh, is it okay to divorce?" Because uh, you know Moses said in the Old Testament, you can divorce, uh, give your give a letter of divorce, and so people come up and ask these questions even now, right? So we must be able to answer these questions, help them to you know, overcome these practical challenges. Sometimes people come from different settings, 
right? So they come from different towns, uh, different backgrounds. Some of them come from a brethren church. They don't believe in the Holy Spirit. They don't give, believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Or sometimes people don't believe in, uh, you know, uh, miracles. They don't believe in miracles. Uh, they believe that all of that stopped in the Book of Acts. So all these things will come up, right? Uh, so we must be able to give good answers through the Word of God. Okay, so we'll stop here. I think uh, after this we have a couple of more. I think next week we can complete our portions. Uh, but here's what I want to say. Through the study of all of this, uh, I would be really encouraged if each one of us truly understand our identity and in small ways begin to take that step of ministering to people. Right? It could be somebody in within your class itself. Right? Uh, I would say when I was in Bible college, those two years were very lonely for me because I couldn't really talk to anybody. Right? But build good friendships. Go speak to people. Sometimes we, the mistake I made was I said, OK, this person, you know, he, he didn't do well in his studies. Maybe he doesn't know. Or this person doesn't know English. Or this person, uh, he's come from a village. He, he won't know what I'm going through. No. Right? But towards the end uh, of my second year, I, I began to go and you know just build each other up, help each other. I, I would ask people, hey, you pray for me. You, you, know, you, you pray, this is the problem I'm going through. Uh, and I would allow people to minister to me. And that way, people began to be very open. OK, so you know, you, you, I know that uh, and we are seeing our faces every day, but be open to ministering to each other. Right? Don't say, okay, no, I am like this, I'll be alone. Don't do that. Right? Minister to each other, bless each other, pray for each other, expect God to move. Amen? Is that okay? Okay, let's just close in a, in a word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you for what you've done, what you're doing in our lives. We thank you, God, for your word. And Lord, we just want to thank you for all the good things that you have doing oh god we ask for your anointing we ask holy spirit that you will empower us lord even as we journey along with you oh god just studying and uh lord just gaining knowledge and wisdom oh god i pray that you will teach us oh god to walk in your ways lord we thank you we thank you that we have the holy spirit inside us that will lead us and guide us oh god lord we pray for each and every student lord even as they are learning oh god may the words may your word just be uh, rooted and grounded in their lives, oh God. And, and I pray, God, that each one of them will recognize their calling and begin to work on their calling, oh God, and just and just fulfill every plan and purpose that you have for their lives, oh God. Lord, we just pray for good relationships, for, for, for Lord, your wisdom in, in, in everything that they're doing, oh God. Even as a servant church, may your grace and your mercy and your strength be upon them, oh God. We thank you, Father. Lord, we just speak a blessing over each and every student here. And I pray, God, that you will use them greatly for your kingdom, oh God. That you will open doors, that you will minister to them, Lord. Even as they pray and worship and seek your face, oh God. I pray, God, that you will open up the heavens and just pour out, Lord, uh, a greater measure of your grace and anointing upon their lives. We thank you, God. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you, everyone, for joining online. Have a great week.